he never lets a day go by without also making a trip to his laboratory and visiting his students amidst all of the other things, which I think is very, very important that, that we all need to, to learn to do, always be in our labs. Uh, and that's going to be followed by Professor Angelo Vulpiani, and he's a professor of physics at the University of Rome. So uh, we look forward to two very good talks. I'm going to invite Yinji Ma to introduce our first speaker for today. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Neil. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Uh, okay, so uh, my our first speaker today is a very distinguished scientist, Professor Morgan Jensen. Uh, Professor Morgan Jensen is a Danish physicist who has been made contribution to the field of complex dynamics and fract fractals. And he currently holds a professorship at the Niels Bohr Institute, University of Copenhagen, and uh, is a former president, former president of the and the secretary general of the Royal Danish Academy of Science and Letters, as you can see uh, in his affiliation. So he has won several prestigious prizes, uh, most notably the Norwegian Physics Prize. Uh, this uh, Gunnar Randers handed over in 2011 by the King Harald um, V of Norway. So he is dealing with the king, by the way. And he has been visiting professor at the University of Chicago and Rome and other universities and also Harvard University. And he has been a member of this Royal Danish Academy of Science and, and also the Secretary of General uh, for four and a half years, as Niels has mentioned, and uh, also serving as a president of the society of the academy uh, for four and a half years. And he was knighted by Queen Margaret of the Second in 2011 and to the first degree in 2020. So should I call you sir, uh, Morgan, maybe? That's up to me. That's up to me, okay. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, without any delay, let, let's welcome Morgan. But I want to uh, unmute. Here's some echoes here. Uh, the, the, the technician here. There seem to be some echo, or maybe I should just uh, lower down the voice. Hello? Hello? There's still uh, some echoes. Uh, okay. Uh, is, there, is there a technician here? There seem to be some echoes here. Do you mind to remove that echo before Morgan speak? Okay. You see this? Doesn't it come from you? No, not from my airplane. I can switch on. I can airplane my mode. My... Hello? 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 You see? This is a problem. Hello? Hello? Better. Okay. 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 Good. All right. Let's move back to the full screen sharing. Okay. I think that's that's good. That's fine, right? Okay. Okay. So now, now let's welcome our first speaker, Morgan Professor Morgan Jensen. Thank you so much for the kind introduction from you and from Jinse. It was double introduction. That's what more can you expect? So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a very general topic today. Uh, actually, you're very welcome to ask questions, but maybe it has to be after the lecture. So I'll, I'll speak for 40 minutes and then you can keep your questions. Um, of complexity in science, a topic I worked on for many, many years. And uh, here you see two, I hope I, yeah, it's okay. You see two complex uh, structures, which I will explain uh, quite soon. And this one works, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> okay, it doesn't want to go forward, this one. Now it is stuck funny enough. Mm -hmm. uh, just a second, just a second, maybe I, eh. Oh, I have to press with my hand. Fine, fine, fine. So I will uh, cover a few topics here tonight. And of course, you can see very broad. I will talk, introduce you to chaos and fractals, a little bit turbulence, avalanches, networks, protein genetics. That's where I work right now. Maybe social paradigms. I'm not sure I get to economics. So that's probably going to too much. Okay, so is this working? Yeah. 
So I work at the Niels Bohr Institute. It's a fantastic place to work. It's 101 years old now. And uh, we are located at a very well-known street in Copenhagen because the Bohr Institute is there, Bleidamsvej. And our group is over here. It's hard to move this one. And also this big building here. And uh, we get quite a lot of visitors. Maybe it's because we have a very good coffee machine. I'm not quite sure always, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great place to work. And of course, in the founding of the Niels Bohr Institute, it was at, at atoms and particles really. But since uh, actually late ages, we have built up a quite big group on these more complex systems. And we have had uh, quite a lot of support from the Institute to do this. So that has been a great uh, challenge. Right now, we are actually we went on a tour to Fairy Island and we were uh, 60 people uh, in our group. So it's both theory and experiment. So as mentioned now several times, I have been very closely associated with the Royal Society. Uh, Danish Academy of Science and Letters. Here you see our very fantastic building. It's built by the founder of Carlsberg, the beer. He likes science a lot. So we are in this house and it uh, has been a great challenge for me to be there. Um, Neil Spohr, my great hero, was also president. Actually, I'm the first president from Bohr Institute since Neil Spohr. But anyway, no comparison. Stop, stop. But uh, he was president for 23 years because usually there's a rule you only sit for four years. Of course, Neil Spohr, there's no rule. So uh, he, he was president uh, quite a lot. And uh, this year, they actually, uh, 1st of October, we celebrated that it's 100 years ago we got the Nobel Prize. And the Queen is patron of the Academy and she has been patron of, of uh, uh, 50 years. So we had a big party. And here you see, uh, just to brag a little bit, I'm talking uh, to the Queen during this fantastic dinner. Anyway, so this is uh, what we call complex dynamics. It's a chaotic structure. And I think also Wolpiani will talk a little bit more about that. That's uh, actually a deterministic system that has some unpredictability. And this is a fancy picture of what's called the Lorentz attractor in seen in a slide. You can find beautiful pictures on the net of this. We have started quite a lot over the years uh, of <clears throat> transition from order, which you kind of see here. This is what's called a bifurcation tree from order into chaos. <clears throat> and uh, you might think that this chaos sounds a little bit, what should I say, loosely defined maybe, but actually very, very precisely well-defined mathematically. And just at the transition here, many of us has worked and there were big contributions in the 80s by Mitchell Feigenbaum. So we study transition from order to chaos. <clears throat> and uh, you see these uh, chaotic structures of uh, often what we call strange attractors. Uh, why strange attractors? They attract solutions in what we call phase space and they look a little strange. That's why strange attractor. And here again, you have a picture of the Lorentz attractor in various uh, kind of, uh, what should I say, seen from different directions. <clears throat> Sometimes you hear in particular in movies and other things that there's something called the butterfly effect. Uh, butterfly effect, people say a butterfly moving, moving its wing over Brazil may cause a tornado over Florida. Uh, and... Uh, that is a little, you might sound a little strange. I mean, the idea is that if, if the butterfly moves its wings, it might create a tornado. If it didn't move its wings, it might not create a uh, tornado. That's what we call initial conditions are very, very close, but they can grow exponentially the difference between these two solutions. So in principle, it's actually possible in the laws of physical to have this butterfly effect. The only thing is, it's maybe not so likely the, the tornado comes over Florida. Actually, we cannot predict where it comes. That's the whole idea. But uh, we can see on our equations that uh, this kind of thing happens. And I can show a little bit here. Here you have two of uh, the Lorentz attract. Again, you have two initial conditions that are very, very close. It's uh, unfortunately a point that doesn't work. Uh, I can try again, it doesn't work. Okay. But uh, I can try with this here. You have initial condition here, another initial condition here, very close. Hard to see here, but we can see on the next picture. Here you see uh, uh, just a normal uh, development of the uh, 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 variable, uh, variable in the Lorentz attractor as a function of time. And down here, you see the difference. So if we go back, we could see the initial conditions are very close. Is this true? Yes, because the difference between the 
uh, blue and the yellow is very, very small in the beginning here, but after some time, suddenly there's a big difference in the two, um, we say trajectories with two initial conditions that are very close. This is a butterfly effect from a mathematical point of view, so it really exists. Here's another fancy picture you can find on the net of transition to chaos, uh, just to show you that. <clears throat> It can look like beautiful. Then there was another concept that came in the end, it's named the concept of fractals. And uh, what is a fractal? Well, if you have a line, we say it has dimension one. If you have a piece of paper, it has dimension two. And if you have a cubus, it has dimension three. It's uh, quite simply to see. But down here, I have a typical mathematical fractal. I take a, a triangle, I cut out the middle triangle, I cut out the middle triangle, and then I go on and go on and go on. And and cut our middle triangles uh, where it's black. And then I get a structure that looks a little bit funny. Uh, it is typical fractal because it reproduces, reproduces itself on all scales. So the whole triangle here is reproduced in this triangle and in the smaller, I'm sorry, the laser pointer is not so sharp. This triangle and this triangle, so it reproduces itself. And it turns out that that structure lies kind of between one and two dimensions. It has a dimension 1.505. Actually, it's an irrational number for people who know mathematics. So you can construct structures in nature that have these non integer dimensions. We call them fractals. And there are many examples in nature. Here are beautiful snowflakes. Why is this a fractal? This is a snowflake. You don't see them here. Sorry, guys. Never snows down here, I hear. But you can come up to Scandinavia. Then it snows every day. So you will rush quickly back to South Africa, I'm sure. It's too, it's too cold. Anyhow, so uh, here you see a branch. You see another branch. You see another branch. You see another branch. So this snowflake has branches and branches and branches down to a certain scale. Then what's called surface tension and other things comes in. But it, it has fractal structure and one can calculate the dimension. It's around 1.7 or something. <clears throat> you could also look at the boundary as clouds. If you look at the boundary of clouds, then you see sort of a racket structure. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, people have studied the boundary of clouds and found that they are also fractal structure and have a certain, certain dimension. <clears throat> now, we come from Scandinavia, Eric and I not Norway, but this is our very good friends, except at the time where we had a lot of wars, but this is some time ago. Now we don't have wars anymore. That's good. I mean, I don't know whether Sweden wants a war with Denmark, but we'll see. Uh, anyhow, the structure, We people say that the coast of Norway is a fractal. Why? Well, you can take a measurement like this box here is maybe around 50 kilometers and you get the length of a Norway coast is a little less than 2,000 kilometers. But think about if you took a stick of one meter, then you had to go into all the fjords, all the fjords. This is famous fjord called Sonefjord, very deep. There are lots of fjords. So if you measure with a stick of maybe one meter, the length of Norway coast might be 5,000 kilometers. So the, uh, we all knew the founder of, he's called the founder of Fractals Mandelbrot, and he said, you cannot talk about the... Uh, length of Norway coast, and in that sense, he was right. Uh, we sometimes make jokes about magnitude; it's very unfair. But uh, you can, in it, he is right. You cannot talk about the length of the Norway coast. The dimension of the Norway coast is around 1.26 or something like this. Anyhow, then it turns out I have shown you this uh, Lorentz attractor several times, and that actually, if you have a little computer, it's very easy to do these uh, solutions. You can find programs on the net uh, to do this. Um, but it turns out that the, stru the structure of this strange attractor, which is chaotic, also is, has fractal dimensions like around 2.1 or something like this. So it lies between two and three dimensions. So it's not a three-dimensional structure, it's again a fractal. <clears throat> so fractals and chaos are very related. Okay, I go a little bit more into what we call mathematical fractals. You can have simple, complex functions, very, very simple squared complex functions, and then you can generate the most beautiful fractals, uh, which actually is also quite easy on a computer. This is called a Julia asset, doesn't matter what it is, but you have a simple uh, kind of uh, uh, complex function and you put it on a computer and uh, you do what's called iterations. And here you see again, branches and branches and branches. 
it also reproduces itself various places. And there's also this called Mandelbrot set after Benoit Mandelbrot I mentioned before. Uh, here again, you see strange, funny thing. And that thing here reproduces itself there, reproduces itself there, and re reproduces it itself uh, many, many places. I have to stop my phone. <laughs> now, um, so fractals are uh, use uh, they they reproduce itself at small at smaller and smaller and smaller scales now is this useful for anything well actually yes it is because you see uh, in particular i showed you norway before norway have a big oil production and what you do with oil production is that you drill a hole in the north sea uh, one hole and another hole and then you pump down water with a big pressure, and then you hope to get oil up um, uh, through the other uh, uh, hole you have uh, uh, drilled. And this is exactly how how uh, you you get water out of the North Sea. And uh, then uh, fract fractals are actually quite quite uh, what should I say important for oil recovery because. You have a kind of what's called granular structure down, with have, which have oil, and uh, as you push water through, the water, water will actually go through a fractal pattern, and that means that a lot of oil doesn't come up. Some people say, where, where geologists and oil production companies says, now we have emptied the, the oil, oil here, 80% is left, so there are lots of oil left. And I, let me comment on that even more because now I try to show you if it works and I don't think it does. I had a fantastic movie here. Can I press it? It worked this morning, but now of course it doesn't work here. Why doesn't it work here? Okay. Anyway, I should have a link. I don't have the link. No. I, anyhow, this is my colleague, Joachim Matisse and Harry Sweeney, a very well-known uh, experimental is our field. You take two glass plates and have oil in between and you pump water down. And if I could have run my movie, which I don't seem to be able to do, then you would have seen that it formed a fractal uh, structure. So actually that is exactly what they do in the North Sea. This is just an idealized experiment in the lab. But um, uh, you see that uh, that there would have been a fractal structure where the water penetrates the oil, and there would be a lot of oil left. Uh, so the one I showed you before was not as good as this one, but here you can see a little bit. It's a little bit not as ideal the experiment, but you can see these fractal fingers. So oil fractals actually are incredibly influential on world economy through oil uh, reproduction. I, I can show you here a few pictures from our colleagues at Oslo University. Why do they do this at Oslo University? That's obvious because uh, Norway is one of the uh, biggest oil production countries in the world. And you can see all kinds of patterns. Some are fractal, some are not. Depends on a little bit how you set up your experiment. But I think uh, I have had close contact with the University of Oslo many, many years. And uh, we have worked on all these kinds of patterns. But you can do an idealized model of this. This is called diffusion limited aggregation. <clears throat> and what you do here, you have a computer model with diffusing particles. You set one particle at the time and you get this beautiful fractal structure built up. You have a branch and a branch and another branch and another branch and another branch. And this is exactly a structure I would have shown you if my video had worked. <clears throat> so, what you see here, the black is actually where uh, the water penetrates the oil and where it's white, the oil is left. So you can see there are lots of oil left. Well, how much oil is left? Well, I have worked on fractal so many years, I can see this as I mentioned roughly 1.75, it's well known. And that means it's a fractal, it doesn't fill anything in, in this plane here. So actually there is a lot of oil left. But many of us have uh, <clears throat> worked in these kind of uh, fractal complex structures over, over many years. And um, actually, when I was at United States University of Chicago, my late mentor Leo Kadanov, he was extremely, uh, what should you say, interested in finding a theory, a, a, a calculation for what the dimension is of this structure. And people still 
didn't uh, gain that goal. It's a very complicated, even though it looks simple, it's very complicated to describe. Okay, so around uh, in the 80s, I had a very uh, good colleague in uh, Israel called Eshel Ben Jacob, who unfortunately died two years ago. And he was very, very interested in seeing whether fractal had any, <clears throat> uh, should we say, anything to say in bacteria growth. And what you have here uh, is uh, you have what's called a simple petri dish that is uh, just a dish with some uh, nutrients on, and you put down uh, bacteria here in the middle, and then they grow actually slowly. Some people say it's the best experiment for experimentalists to do. Why? Because you put the bacteria down, you go on vacation for two weeks, and you come back, and you have done the experiment. You don't have to, to be in the lab. It has to grow slowly. And you see, first it grows a little bit compact, and then it branches out with branches, 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 and become a nice fractal. <clears throat> Some bacteria are not fractal, depends on the species. Here you have another one, also uh, bacteria, and I show a little, uh, uh, I show more. Uh, so some of them grow extremely complex and uh, fractal-like patterns. <clears throat> this is also bacteria, and you can see it grows like these kind of fractal-like fingers. And for specialists, you can see there's a chirality. Why? Because you can see there is a kind of turning around of the uh, branches of this bacterial growth. And this is also bacteria, which you, if you remember what I showed you, what I called the mathematical fractal, well, looks more or less exactly the same as this one. So, um, of course, what Eshel Ben Jacob did was to classify the different fractal bacterial growth with fractal dimensions and compare them and see which species do what and so on. But you can see it's a, it's a zoo because they behave in very, very different uh, ways. And uh, as I said in the beginning, many bacteria also grow in complex structures. So this was a little jump into how we use complex uh, theories in, uh, in biology. And this is uh, roughly where I am now, and I come to a little later. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's nevertheless uh, look a little bit up or actually look at ourselves from outside. Here uh, we see that uh, we have the, the earth uh, taken from uh, far distance and we see all the weather uh, fronts here moving around and the atmosphere is very turbulent and a very chaotic and also have fractal structures I showed you the clouds and so on. And you know very well when you fly in the airplane, when the pilots say, oh, we go into turbulence, then uh, uh, the plane might shake. Well, actually the, the sh it shakes in then what we call intermittent way. Suddenly it shakes and it's quiet. Then you said, oh, now it's over. Boop. Then it shakes again, right? We all have tried this. So this is because uh, the atmosphere is, is very chaotic and you have strong winds and so on. This now it works here, yeah? Now this is a, just a picture I sometimes show. This is a match and it has some smoke and uh, you see the smoke curls in a kind of what we call a vortex that uh, the, the smoke falls off. Uh, now I show it, uh, sometimes I'm a little bit in doubt whether it's con constructed, I have to say. Can, can nature really be that beautiful? Uh, probably, it's, probably it's real. And uh, when you boil water, this is a nice way to create turbulence because when you start to boil water for coffee in the morning, you maybe put cold water down and that's still. But then when you heat more, suddenly the water start to move, we call it convection. And that convection gets harder and harder and the end, the water boils where these kind of, we call them plumes. That's a hot water that boop, comes up to the surface. This is when we say, uh, uh, the uh, water uh, boils. And actually there's also all kinds of fractal structures in this turbulent motion here. I don't have time to get into this, but I can maybe show you even more simple detail. This is just from a little bonfire, a little fire. It's our previous dean uh, from Copenhagen and he just took a laser pointer like the hammer, one I have here. No, that, that work, uh, let me put it that way. Took a laser pointer and just a camera. And what do you see in this smoke? You see beautiful, beautiful, what you say, what, what's its structure? We also say coherent structures um, of all length scales. So this, uh, just this uh, hot uh, air above the fire has all kinds of geometrical properties, which Angelo, Eric, and I have studied in many years. Turbulence has been a big field in physics for many years. So uh, it combines 
fractals and chaos in a kind of very profound way. And there are still lots of do to understand turbulence. Here I have a nice picture from the Japanese um, artist Hukusai. And you see what she is in the big wave here. And you see how the wave breaks in kind of bigger structure, bigger structure, bigger structure. You almost draw a drawing here. You see a fractal kind of pattern of the of the waves coming down. And these people down here are a little bit in trouble, but seem, seem to do it. So um, you can measure um, what we call how energy in this, for instance, in the wind, if you measure... Uh, uh, the wind velocity high up in the atmosphere, and then you calculate what we say dissipation, that is how the kinetic energies goes into heat. It, it doesn't matter too much, but what, what you see here is what I said before, that the velocity of the uh, wind is intermittent. Sometimes there's big velocity, other times it's quiet. Sometimes there's big velocity, other times it's quiet. And this we call intermittency. And uh, some, some of us also call it avalanches. And uh, why do I call it avalanches? My late mentor, Pierre Bach, he introduced uh, in many complex systems that you have these avalanches, that means dynamics. This is uh, like earthquakes. If you live in say California or in Italy, then there are very, very many small earthquakes, very many, all the time. In California, if you measure, you can see it every five minutes. But of course, uh, then there's uh, maybe a bigger one and then there can be a huge one uh, every maybe 10, 20 years, luckily, it's not so often. So, so uh, <clears throat> this is what we call avalanche theory, that you have uh, these uh, avalanches of different sizes. You have many small, you have some little bigger, and you have a few of the largest, but you have the largest ones. We say it's non-Gaussian. It has, the largest one has higher probability. And there's a paradigm model, co uh, model con the Pierre Park sand pile. I have a, an applet showing this, but I cannot get it to work now, unfortunately. Maybe maybe after I can show it to you, some of you. So I have to jump over this. I wanted just to say a little bit about a topic that surely is of interest to all of us, that is climate. Well, chaos, weather, and climate are connected, of course, in one way or the other. I said before that the atmosphere is chaotic and turbulent. So that means weather prediction are uncertain. You know very well if you see weather prediction. Well, the first two days is more or less correct often, but after six, seven days, it has uncertainty. Why is that? That's because the atmosphere is chaotic. Do you know what's the best weather prediction for tomorrow is? It's 70% correct. What's the best weather prediction for tomorrow? Can someone scream that? What did you say? <laughs> because it rains today. So the worst weather prediction for tomorrow is 70% correct. It is like today, namely. So why don't meteorologists say, oh, the weather tomorrow is like today? Well, it doesn't go in the long run. So people, of course, also have climate models. Climate models are big, what we say, deterministic computer models you put on a computer, many, many degrees of freedom. And of course, we know that if these models are nonlinear, which, which they are, then they can be chaotic. And therefore, of course, not it'd be very hard to trust 100,000 years ahead. Um, so one have to take where climate models with some uncertainty for sure. But we have a group at the Nielsen Institute that drills ice in Greenland, and therefore they can go many years back. And just wanted to show you a few um, uh, diagrams. Here we go 140,000 years back because they can see in the ice uh, every every year 140 years back, actually 500 years back. I show in the next slide. But this is from Greenland, and next slide is from the Antarctic. But here you see the temperature that you see. Oh. Um, that actually we have the temperature here, uh, 20,000 uh, years ago, it was what's called the small ice age. And then it has been going up and down and up and down and up and down. And around 120 years ago, it was just as high as now. So high temperature has certainly existed before. Now I show you another graph here. I think it's quite interesting. That goes 400,000 years back. And it's also from drilling uh, ice. So it's a fantastic record you get here. Okay. Uh, let's first look at the temperature I showed you before until 
hotter than 20 years ago. It's called Emian. Um, there you see the temperature just as high. Then it comes up again as high as now. Then it, you have an ice age to come up again, almost periodic, almost periodic. So that's of course uh, well known, but uh, we talk about a lot about CO2. If I forget a little bit, if I go 120 years back, CO2 was very, very high. Why? It's related to high temperature like now. Uh, if I go, what is it, uh, 250 years, thousand years back, high CO2, high temperature. If I go 350 years back, high CO2, high temperature. And what about sea level is also related. Come on, this is fantastic data. It tells us that um, clearly we expect CO2 to be high now. Well, except for one thing here, guys. If you look at this green one, which I jumped over, that is much higher CO2 than uh, previous 400,000 years. So there's absolutely no doubt that we have higher CO2 now than uh, we have had uh, over 400,000 years. Now the temperature so far is not uh, shockingly higher than it was 120,000 years ago. And the sea level is much uh, higher. But uh, the question is, of course, we all discuss is uh, how will a uh, long lasting effect will this clearly high level of CO2 in the atmosphere have? Well, there was a recent uh, United Nations climate uh, report and uh, it shows here that uh, using these models, you can believe it or not, but uh, they say that um, uh, if, if we didn't uh, have polluted the atmosphere with CO2 and other things, temperature would not have increased. <clears throat> and here you, you see observed and what they say simulated um, uh, according to having high CO2. So oh, there's surely a difference. What maybe is a little funny, they say, oh, there's a big difference between 1.08 uh, Celsius calculated and 1.1. That was the big news in the pan panel report, which I think is a little bit funny. But uh, anyway, there's no question for, uh, that uh, the human uh, uh, activities influences uh, uh, our climate, I think. It's not enormous increase in temperature right on over say 100 years. So may probably still possible to do things about it. Okay, now I show you the thing. I look at my watch, I have around 12, 15 minutes to go. Okay, so um, here you see another nice fractal structure. What is that? Something completely different. This is when plankton blooms. Um, uh, that's my phone rings, I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, when plankton blooms, you have all this uh, nice fractal structure, which is related to the uh, uh, turbulent motion in, in the uh, ocean. This, I think, is around Brazil, and here you see around Iceland is up here, and you see the flat plankton blooms uh, every two years, and uh, it's a, you see it, of course, with a uh, uh, satellite, and you can see this uh, beautiful uh, turbulent fractal patterns, as I, I would call them. <clears throat> now, so now I, I step into a slightly different uh, complexity phenomena, which we call networks. <clears throat> and networks also have fractal structures and networks are one of the most active research uh, area in, in our complex uh, uh, field, I, I should say. Here you see the internet. <clears throat> Uh, in the United States, actually, this graph is, I think, 10 years old, but it doesn't matter. You see the connection of the internet um, in the United States. So this kind of United States. Where do you think this is? Which city is this? Where there are enormous amount of links coming out uh, on the internet. Where do you think that is? <laughs> what? No, it's where the power is, you know, it's... It's Washington, of course, there's a lot, lot, lot of links coming out of Washington. This, I think, is probably Denver. There's a lot of military and security in Denver, and there's Los Angeles. So, so, so you see what the way we measure the fractal structure of this is to see how many links go out of a hop. These, these, well, many links are called hops, and, and you check that, and that's what we call power law. So it's scale-free network. And here you see, uh, what we call a food web that can be a, um, a lake 
where you have different species and see how they interact with each other. And here you have a protein network. This is what I work on. And uh, what is a protein network? Uh, here is, I show you how yeast looks. This is how yeast looks. Think about that when you ba bake bread. What do we have here? You have how all the probably 2000 known uh, proteins and genes in yeast interact with each other. And uh, if, if it's a green line, it means interact positive. What does mean if there's high level of that protein, you have high level of the other protein. If, if there's a red link, which there are many of, it's, it's the other way around. That means that high level will decrease, um, high level of one will decrease each other. And that's uh, typical for a protein network. It's in, infinitely complicated this. But again, it has fractal structure. We say it's scale-free network. And uh, I used to say it takes one graduate student just to find a line here. Why? Because you have to uh, do a lot of measurement how uh, one gene affects another. And this, of course, from a data bank where all, all knowledge about uh, protein network of yeast is collected in a data bank. And you can look that up. This is another one of the same, actually slightly older. And again, you see some, if I appear, you see some hops here. This is like Washington, but now in, in yeast right there, it has a lot of links from it. We say it's a hop with many links and some other hops have fewer links on this slightly. Also yeast, you see again, some of the hops with many links and some with fewer links. So. This is infinitely complicated, but you can do statistical investigation. That means uh, look whether it, it has fractal property in the sense how the distribution of these hops scale. Now, <clears throat> here is a, then a protein network uh, I have worked on for years called an NF kappa B. And uh, I just show you here that again, this is slightly simpler than uh, uh, slightly simpler than the yeast, uh, but that's simply because people haven't drawn all the links they know. But you see this protein itself is up here, and then there are many other links and many other proteins uh, sitting here, we know from the cell. But at least I have been interested in this. If you try to inflame cells, then it's observed now through many, many groups that nf kappa B oscillate in time in a single cell. So the density of a given protein in a single cell will oscillate up and down with a period of some hours. You can get it to oscillate for single cells over, over actually a week and, and so on and so forth. So we have simplified this genetic network. We have simplified it a lot just to see who are the main players and who are the main players in this we call feedback loop, which initiate these uh, oscillations. <clears throat> so now, um, you can write down a simple uh, model and we do that with differential equations. And I definitely don't expect everybody to know, but differential equations is a fantastic tool in mathematics where you see how different variables and we have three variables, NF kappa B is a protein. Uh, and then there's something I kappa B, we call it inhibitor and I kappa B messenger. It doesn't matter too much, but we write uh, the time variation of these in terms of complicated nonlinear functions. And then we can reproduce uh, the experimental data uh, quite well. As you see as a typical, what we see deterministic signal, it's smooth, whereas the experimental data are uh, <clears throat> very noisy. So uh, this one have to deal with when one works with biological data. I don't have too much time to come into that. We have over the recent years said, oh, we can also oscillate another protein from outside and get these two uh, inside oscillator and outside oscillator to couple. This is like two uh, pendula uh, that couples to metronome, for instance, on a piano that couples to each other. And then actually we can find in the cell dynamics, find a chaotic um, uh, structure, a strange attractor, we find from these equations. So if we find exactly the same uh, kind of chaotic behavior as you find in, in, in uh, boiling water, so to say. But of course it looks different and it comes from these equations. This we think are very important for gene uh, regulation. So the last five minutes, I'll make you a little quiz. Um, now some years ago, we had a student project 
that we said, oh, can't we use uh, Google searching machine? You all know that. Can't we use Google searching machine to build up these networks? Yes, why not? Uh, you can write uh, uh, to, to you can write uh, something. Actually, we did it for first for politicians. I don't want to show this because it's ten years old. Uh, but we wrote, for instance, this was uh, we, uh, George Bush was president in the United States. So we wrote Bush and then came 10 million. You can then say how many hits on, uh, on Google, 10 million hits. Unfortunately, many were garden bushes. This was not President Bush. So you have to be a little careful what you write. But you can just write uh, some term there like Coca-Cola. I'll show you in a second and see how many uh, hits come up. But you can also write two things. You can write, say, Coca-Cola and vacation. And that means you see how many home pages on Google has both Coca-Cola and uh, vacation. Now I have a quiz for you guys. Here we built up a network with this. And you can see, indeed, we I had exactly Coca-Cola here. I think also vacation should be, I can, I'm not sure I can see it. We have TV, we have computer, we have... Uh, so when we put a link here, we put a link between two uh, topics here. If there were, as far as I remember, this is now actually 10 years ago, there were over 1 million uh, homepages, which both uh, had computer and Coca-Cola, then we draw a link. If it was less, uh, less than 1 million, we did not write, we did not write a link. And uh, here you have money, you have uh, uh, war, you have CIA, you have snow. Uh, you see snow and travel is related, Santa Claus, so oh, it's very difficult with this point of Santa Claus, and Christmas is related, not strange. And here is a quiz to you guys. What is behind the green here? Uh, you have love, sex, car, TV, money, news. Uh, what could be behind? I used to say when I gave this quiz, it starts with love and sex, and then maybe car, and then TV. Uh, very good, who said marriage? You get a beer outside, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you guessed before I came to, I said it usually ends in war. You see, war, war is also. <laughs> War is there, right? Yeah, yeah, war is over here. Yeah, but you guessed before. That was uh, pretty good. Uh, that was very fast. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, money, exactly. <laughs> okay, so you can build networks this way. We also used Twitter. This was Google Twitter. We just looked a little at the tweet rates. How, how tweet, tweet, tweet rates go up and down. And again, you can see it's completely intermittent. It looks completely like turbulence. That intermittent here, we have IBM, Pepsi, uh, and Toyota. And um, now I show you my very good student, Matthias Heldberg, refuses me to show this usually. Uh, why is that? Because he's an Arsenal fan. And uh, this is Carlsberg. And at that time, Liverpool had Carlsberg some years ago. Liverpool had Carlsberg on their shirt. And uh, at that, uh, there was a Saturday where Liverpool beat Car Arsenal 5-1. to one. He, Matthias said, you don't show this, except for the fact now I just communicated with him yesterday because Arsenal is number one in England right now. So now he said, oh, now we can, no, it's okay to show Arsenal. Um, I can't, uh, uh, the Royal Academy of Science kind of owns Carlsberg. So I, uh, we, we did various studies of the Twitter rates, but you see, it's, it's really it's really influential how you see how much commercial important commercial that Liverpool had Carlsberg many years um, uh, on their shirt uh, of course was important. Here actually we see we <laughs> looked at Starbucks and then Starbucks and sleep, uh, and of course many people I I I mean many people in the night I think the scale here is a little bit out. Many people in the night, oh, I cannot sleep. I was at Starbucks. I cannot sleep. I was at Starbucks. Well, except on Saturday, people say, okay, it doesn't matter too much. If I don't sleep, I can sleep long, right? So there the Starbucks and coffee is lower, but Starbucks is higher. So, you know, of course, people drink coffee <coughs> um, uh, Saturday. Now, 
we could look at this intermittency. I don't have time to do this. It's also non-Gaussian. It's like turbulence, and you have power low distributions. I just want to end by one thing. We have studied pa scientific paradigms. You know, in, in science, there are many scientists here today. You can have you have concept that really so they boils up and becomes extremely important in a time like nano string theory, systems biology. Chaos, chaos came up in the 80s and was big and then kind of declined because many things were understood. But um, we 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 made a model for uh, for 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 this paradigm grow and uh, I don't have I, I think I just end by showing the results. What we found was here different paradigms have different colors. So you see, uh, for instance, here there are many, many different paradigms, not really one that will dominate. Uh, also here, here you have two paradigms, the, the, the red and the blue that kind of dominate, are, are living next to each other. It could be like nanophysics and string theory, as I said before, something. Um, and then they are, they are eroded slowly, slowly other paradigms comes in. Now here's a little bit interesting. So you see here they eroded. Here's the interest, and suddenly the yellow paradigm will fill uh, everything. So what could that be? That could be extraterrestrial uh, <laughs> species, maybe. We didn't see that yet, but you know, some some paradigm that really, or black holes, for instance, and so on. And then then it, it erodes again. So we actually again found this kind of intermittency between the different paradigms uh, coming up. So I think my time is exactly out with 40 minutes. I have tried to do my best in taking you a tour in what we call complex science, complex different uh, topics in complex science uh, I have worked on and many uh, other sciences I've worked on. And it's a great topic because we have, we can, you, in complex systems, you can sh shift interest reasonably fast, which is higher, uh, more difficult, for instance, in superconductivity and so forth. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Professor Jensen. Is there any questions that you have for Professor Jensen? Sally. Ah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's an online question um, from ah. Manoj. It says, why do bacteria exhibit a fractal growth pattern and do all bacteria exhibit this? Why? So why is this fractal? And do all bacteria okay. exhibit it? The last one, I think I said, oops, I have here. The last one, certainly not all bacteria growth are fractal. And why is it fractal? Well, you can use these models I showed you, which we call diffusion limited models. And it could be because there can be nutrients that diffuses around and kind of promotes this kind of fingering structure. So I think uh, people, uh, this group in Israel really understood this, yes. <clears throat> Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, so my 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 question is a little bit off, but uh, when I see the beautiful structure of fractals, I it this recalls me the very beautiful art of M. C. Escher, uh, which ah. painted. But <laughs> did he has a notion of fractals while he was doing artistic work? No, I don't think Escher had because you know these are the stairs and so on. But there's a guy called Hofstadter who uh, had fractal sort of uh, patterns, uh, very beautiful actually, wave functions. Uh, I think I wouldn't call Hoff, uh, I wouldn't call Asia fractal. And the other question is, do you find anything, because I'm an astrophysicist, do you yes. find anything interesting in the universe that could also have some interesting <laughs> fractal structure? Some people, years? some people say the microwave background had fractal structures in particular in a group in Rome has said that for many years, but it's sort of uh, I don't know the uh, I don't know the status, but you know the original structure you find in in the in the very early universe could have some fractal properties <clears throat> within some scales, most likely actually. Hmm. Okay, one more question. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, if we are talking about dominant paradigms. Can you also map this on uh, political uh, yes, ideas yes, and how they yes, how yes. they uh, <laughs> spread? And yeah. could you make a prediction for the political future of this country? Uh oh, <laughs> you know, you are you are sitting between one from Italy and one from Sweden. It's just as complicated there, and also in Denmark. <laughs>
No, the idea were what we put into the model is that, oh, you should hear about uh, an idea, a paradigm, right? So, so uh, we put in a model that you didn't have to necessarily hear to hear by from your colleague. You can hear from a colleague in the United States. We put in the certain probability, and therefore it could grow. Uh, but I think for sure in Denmark we see right now a, a two new parties completely coming up like this and dominating. So I'm quite sure you can use. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you yeah. for uh, to Professor Jensen for this fighting talk. Thank you. Really <laughs> appreciate it. There's a small token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I think Angelo, you should come up. Ah, yes, yes. yes. Our next speaker for today is Professor Angelo Volpiani. He's from the University of Rome. Uh, Angelo and myself sat across each other yesterday at dinner, and he's a very exciting you know, yeah, man with a lot of stories to tell from all over the world. So we, we look forward to a very nice presentation. I'm going to invite Inji Ma now to introduce the speaker. Okay, uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, right before uh, we, I introduce, I just want to acknowledge the strong support from this uh, National Institute of Theoretical and Computational Science, led by my friend, Professor Francesco, Francesco Porcicconi, for this event, and also the strong support from the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study. Without them, the, this is also impossible because they, they really uh, uh, financially and uh, support it and also uh, support a, a lot of things in the last two weeks. So let's give them applause as well. Right, uh, and our next speaker is Professor Angelo Vupiani. Uh, he is a full professor at, uh, at the University of Rome in Italy, and he studied um, physics at the La uh, Sapienza University of Rome, and he graduated in 1977 with supervisor uh, Giovanni John Lassino, right? And then he is basically a professor uh, from then uh, of the theoretical physics, at the Department of Physics at these universities. Okay, and in 2021, he received the Statistical and Nonlinear Physics Prize of the European Physics Society. Maybe, maybe. Okay, and um, in recognition of his contribution to the field of statistical mechanics, he is also a prolific author of books, both popular and specialized. And so he is talking about predicting the future, an old problem from a modern perspective. I, I believe we should kill the, 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 the echo problem before we... Hello? 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 Now it's good. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. This will go on. This will be showing up like that.
Isso. Deixa eu ver. Vai. Ok. Uh, thanks. Uh, I am very happy to be here. My first time in, uh, in South Africa. Actually, my first time in, in, in Africa. And um, uh, I discuss about uh, a, um, a topic with this prediction, which is a natural wish for, you know, for us. And um, let me, so apparently prediction sound very practical uh, topics, but uh, it's relevant also from a conceptual point of view. I, I am, a, my, my field is theoretical physics. I am not uh, involved in a practical activity. Uh, so, um, Why prediction? So, um, uh, if you, uh, as far as I know, the first uh, uh, the first uh, uh, discussion about prediction is in the Bible, in the Coelet book. In the Coelet book, uh, somewhere is written, uh, what has been uh, done will be done again. Usually, the, the Coelet people remind uh, nothing new under the sun. But uh, uh, this is more, from a scientific point of view, this is much more, much more important. And... Uh, If you try to translate this in a scientific term, this means that uh, it's more or less natural to, to think that if the system behaves in a certain way, then even the future will be in, in the same way. And uh, this uh, uh, suggests that uh, there are some regularity in nature. And uh, the, because of this regularity, one can hope that to build a, a scientific activity. And uh, uh, so uh, looking on the, on the on the web, I found uh, Uh, this uh, I I confess that I don't know uh, the, the rules of, of cricket, so I don't know exactly what it means this. But I, I guess it's something about the prediction of the match island uh, South uh, South, uh, South Africa about uh, cricket. For sure, you you can appreciate much better than me on this. Uh, so uh, there are many different ways to 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 do a prediction. This is a very traditional one, and. Uh, At least in, in, in Europe is common. I don't know. It is. And uh, uh, there are, uh, if you if you look uh, on on the web, uh, for example, on Wikipedia, there are an astonishing list of possible uh, way to predict the future. This is just uh, the beginning of this list. So it's very funny. So the abacomancia by with prediction with the dust. That is uh, aeromancia, the prediction with atmospheric uh, condition. Uh, my one of my preference is arachnomancia, the, the prediction with the spiders. So, is it, so there are very, oh, this is just the beginning. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, some hundred or so. And uh, okay, this, but this is le less funny. This is a booklet with my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Gamaitoni, uh, Luca Gamaitoni. Unfortunately, it's written in a very marginal language. So you know, if you want, uh, we can send you the PDF. So. <laughs> and so, um, Now, um, the, the, there are a very different kind of prediction. Let me just uh, this list uh, four. So for one natural prediction, what is the position of the moon tomorrow at midnight? So another uh, about the possibility of rain tomorrow at half past uh, uh, 12 in Durban, or, or maybe the same question, but not tomorrow, but in, in three weeks. Uh, or more interesting, the, 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 the number, which will be the, the, the winner number of Lotto. I don't know, uh, also here, here there is Lotto game, okay. Lotto or whatever. Uh, okay, then other, if you are interested in, uh, in, uh, in gold, uh, what is the, the, the value of stock option of gold and Johannes Gold starts in change tomorrow or next week, okay? So these are four questions, okay? Then uh, let, let us try to, to reply to, to, to argue this question. So about the first question, it's simple, it's trivial. So everybody's able to, to know where, uh, to predict the position of the moon tomorrow. You look on the uh, at, um, astronomical table and that's it. Uh, about the second, about the meteorolo meteorology, the, about the, the rain tomorrow, this is not so difficult. Maybe one possibility as I suggest by Moens, where since tomorrow there was rain, is a, uh, Good probability. It, it's, it's wise to say that tomorrow it will be rain, but to be more precise, you can ask to the meteorological service. And the meteorological service, they have some technique. And, and for tomorrow, is, I am pretty sure that the, the, the prediction will be correct. In three weeks, I am not so sure that it will be correct. 
not not because your meteorological service not is good. Huh? So for sure it's good as it's good in the other place of the world. But uh, I guess there is no good uh, there is no meteorological prediction in three weeks, which is uh, reliable. About the lotto game, uh, I am very sorry. So not uh, <laughs> there is no there is no chance. And uh, about the the prediction of the optional gold in uh, Johannesburg. Oh, it, this is a, this is a controversial problem because uh, some school believe that uh, it's possible to uh, to understand the, the 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 behavior of the stock market according. Uh, other people claim that that is not possible because the the price on the stock market is, is just because. Uh, uh, some uh, obscure or irrational behavior, insider trading or criminal activities or what, whatsoever. Okay, so now um, let, let, let us uh, try to, to, to approach the problem in, uh, in a systematic way, let's say scientific way, using a pompous, pompous term. Uh, uh, the, the first things we want to understand, uh, the nature of the problem you are you are, you, are, you are considering. So one possibility if the, the system is deterministic, what means deterministic is in few words, deterministic means that the future is uh, determined by the present, okay? In, uh, uh, for example, like, like, like in the Newtonian mechanics, the, me the, 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 the mechanics we study in high school, okay? And uh, this is one possibility. Uh, or maybe uh, there are, ju ju this is not possible, you are just uh, probabilistic uh, rules. This is another possibility. So you have to understand uh, which kind of approach we have to, to adopt. Uh, a second point is uh, the, to, to individuate uh, what is the relevant variable. Uh, for example, imagine that, so, uh, about the problem of uh, rain tomorrow. Uh, the, the rain tomorrow. So you are interested in, in the rain because you want to go a picnic. Uh, in the park, okay, but uh, so uh, it's not enough that you uh, you study uh, water. Uh, you had, it's important also to study the wind, and also not only to study the the, the situation here in Durban, but even in the in the place around Durban. Why? Uh, because uh, the, the the equation of fluid dynamics suggests this. So th th this this aspect is not is not uh, is not marginal. It's very important historically. For example, until uh, the Newton, uh, Galileo, and uh, Newton time. Uh, the people believe that in mechanical problem, the important aspect was just the position of the particle. Then uh, only after Galileo and Newton, uh, the people realized that uh, what is important is not only the position, but also, also the velocity. And this is not, uh, this was an enormous progress in, in, in the science. Okay, now, um, uh, the, the difficulty, the difficulty to do the prediction, uh, le let me consider, different level of difficulty. Uh, the, the simplest one is that uh, the, uh, there exists an evolution law and uh, we know this evolution law. This, for example, is the case of the astronomy, the astronomy of meteorology. In the astronomy of meteorology, we know the equation and we know the, 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 the variable, okay? Then there is the difficulty to, to study, but at least this is a good starting point. Another situation that the, there exists the evolution law, but we don't know. Exactly. For example, this is the earthquake system. In earthquake, uh, in principle, we know the equation, but we don't know the, the boundary condition. We don't know what is the, the structure uh, five uh, miles under our feet. Okay. And so, uh, in principle, this is the equation, but we don't know the, 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 the we don't know this equation. Um, the, the last, no, the, the third uh, possibility that uh, we don't know whether this equation there exists or not. For example, in finance, in finance or in social phenomena, some school, some people claim that there is some law, other people don't think so. So uh, this is an uh, open, an open um, problem. So uh, about the, the prediction, uh, one important aspect is this of the determinism. And in the, in the story of determinism, there is this famous uh, uh, sentence of Laplace uh, about uh, the, 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 so this is the idea of a super mathematician, which is so smart and so powerful that the super mathematician is able to control any, everything, is also able to have infinite mathematical uh, ability. Uh, for this super mathematician, the, the future will have no, no, uh, no surprise, okay? 
And um, what, what, what this is very important um, uh, statement in the history of, um, of, of, of science. And uh, it's surprising this has been written in a book devoted to probability. This is not, uh, very, very, very strange. Uh, this is the Marquise Pierre Simon de Laplace, a very, very interesting uh, character. I have no time to discuss. Well, he was a genius, not only in, in science, he was, was, was very, very smart uh, in few words. So uh, he, he, he had an astonishing career, uh, starting from the Ancien Regime. And then uh, with the revolution, uh, he realized that he was uh, a vivid Republican. And then with Napoleon, he accepted immediately Napoleon uh, point of view. And then after, you know, oh, maybe the king is much better. And uh, and at the end, he was Marquis. So he was really a genius in there. He was also minister with the, with the, with the Napoleon. And um, I guess it's one of the few cases of, of uh, um, scientists who have been also uh, good in politics, at least, at least good for himself. And, uh, and so uh, now, uh, coming back to uh, an example of a uh, simple uh, way, a simple situation where the prediction is uh, is obvious. So the the the, the high school uh, problem of a stone uh, failing. No? So we know very well. So uh, after uh, the time t, the, the position is one half g t square, huh? and uh, and the velocity is g t. This is very, very simple. So in this case, uh, everything is obvious. Everything is clear. It's, it's extremely simple to predict uh, the future. This is an exercise for the student in, uh, in high school, I guess, at, at least at my time. And uh, um, more, so, something similar, but OK, so, sorry. Here I introduced the differential equation, but don't, don't worry. I, oh, this is uh, some. OK, don't worry. Um, the harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator is a typical exercise for students in mathematics, physics, engineering in the first year. So it's a, it's a mass with the spring, and it's possible to solve the equation explicitly. Don't, if you don't understand the symbol, don't worry. So the, just the, what's important, uh, uh, there is this uh, differential equation. This differential equation is nothing but the Newton law, okay? written in, in this um, strange way. And uh, you see that if you know the initial position and if you know the velocity, you can uh, determine the, the future of the system. This is nothing, nothing. Uh, so this is the case where the, uh, uh, is not necessary a super mathematician, but just a diligent student. Okay? And uh, um, so if you don't know the, uh, already, already Moens uh, introduced the differential equation. If you are not familiar with the differential equation, don't worry, I explain you it. In 20 seconds. Uh, so, uh, differential equation uh, formally is this. Uh, this oh. No, oh, oh. No, it is rule. Oh. You, you see the. No. Oh. Oh. This is the point. Okay. The, 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 first, uh, the first equation. And uh, what is the meaning? So, the, the, the translation is what you read here. So this gives you the, the rule how change the system in a short time. Okay, you start at time t, and then you want to know what happened time at, at t plus delta t, and with this with, with that, that rule. And uh, apart some uh, technicality, this is the way where the people uh, put the equation on the computer, because in general, it's not possible to solve the equation, the differential equation, but it's, po it's possible to, 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 to solve uh, uh, numerically. And so one, one can say, oh, fine. Now, now we have very big, very powerful computer. Why we don't, uh, we take the question, we put on the computer and that's it. So instead of uh, the, 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 the super mathematician of Laplace doesn't exist, but it is virtually, it's the supercomputer. It's the supercomputer of this university is surely is a very big computer. We use this big computer and uh, uh, this is the, 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 the um, uh, we say um, virtual version of super mathematician, but there, this is not so. Uh, so uh, the situation is not so simple. Why? Because this is and can be complex, whatever means complex. As you already Moens introduced that to the, this idea of a complex system. Uh, so, for example, complex can be one situation where you, we have a lot of variables, like in uh, meteorology. Uh, one, one is a possible trouble, 
and you have a lot of um, variable like in meteorology and climatology. Another, another, pro, another source of trouble is, is chaos, as already discussed uh, uh, by moments. So chaos means that the, the famous butterfly. So the famous butterfly is to translate in less uh, rhetoric way, means that if you start, uh, if you have a small mistake at the beginning, this mistake increase very fast, very fast, exponentially fast. Okay, so and uh, okay, this is the the essence of uh, the essence of chaos that we already discussed by moments. So I, I can uh, I can go on. And but um, so um, no, okay. Um, so this this idea that the computer can be able to to solve any problem uh, is an old idea. And even uh, great scientists um, arrived to their own conclusion. Uh, for example, John von Neumann. John von Neumann was a giant of, of mathematics, not all, also all physics. And uh, I guess one of the few, one of the few is mistake that he was, uh, he thought that it was possible to um, not only to predict the weather and the climate, but also to, to control. So this is an idea. When I was a kid in the 60s, there was this idea that it's possible to, to, uh, to force the rain, the, the rain uh, spreading some dust with the, with the plants. So it was this, this, this was, in some sense, a consequence of this idea of, uh, of von Neumann. But von Neumann was, was wrong. It was not good. Why? Why? Because of, of, because of, uh, because of chaos. Uh, the, the man who introduced chaos is this gentleman. Henri Poincaré was a great, uh, great uh, uh, scientist, not only mathematician, also philosopher, physics, uh, whatever, um, French. And he studied an astronomical problem, the, the three body, the, the three body in a, a gravitational interaction. And this is sound uh, an innocent problem, but uh, only three bodies. You know, doesn't sound so so difficult, but he realized that is uh, is impossible. The other the other father is this gentleman, Edward Lawrence, who in some sense rediscovered chaos because the chaos has been discovered uh, by by Lawrence in uh, eighteen ninety. And for many many decades, uh, the people didn't care for this uh, for, for some reason, and then it's been rediscovered in, in the sixty by. Uh, Lawrence and other people uh, like Enon, Chirigo, okay, and so on. And so, and okay, this is the famous sentence of the butterfly already discussed by moments, so I can go on faster. And uh, so, uh, just to show that the, the butterfly effect, you can have this butterfly effect. That, so, is introducing a meteorological problem. You say, oh, there is this story of the butterfly because the meteorological problem is a very complicated system with a lot of variable. Uh, in mathematical term, a partial differential equation. No, uh, it's possible to have only, uh, even in extremely simple, apparently stupid system like this. This is, uh, here, here the time is discrete. So this is rule, this is called logistic map. This means that if you know the variable at xt, you compute the variable at xt plus one according to this rule. It's extremely simple. You can play at home with your, it's enough an Excel uh, uh, stuff. Okay, so in this case, it's possible to prove by end that uh, at each time a mistake double. So if a mistake double, uh, you, then you start with a small mistake that at time one you have two, twice, then four, then eight, 16. And it, believe me, it's very fast. Just to show how this is fast, this is the situation where we start with two initial conditions and the difference is uh, uh, four, 10 to minus six extremely small. So if you see from the picture, uh, until, on this scale until, uh, what is, 12, 13, uh, appear the same, okay? They are not the same, okay? uh, But then the difference is enormous. With only, only um, uh, 15, 16 iteration, the, 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 the prediction is completely, is completely wrong. So this is a source of, this is a source of trouble. How, how you can, when, it's possible to formalize this idea. Uh, this is one of the few equations I wrote, uh, only this. So. And uh, it's, uh, this is called Lyapun exponent in honor of uh, uh, Lyapun, who was a great uh, Russian mathematician. And the, the idea is the following. Uh, one, one, one look uh, at the growth of the, 
uh, a mistake, delta x, and uh, the rate, the, the rate of, the, of this, the, the, the rate of the growth is exponential lambda t, and uh, this uh, this is the uh, lambda. Uh, t, uh, the inverse of lambda is the time. What is the meaning? The, the, the practical meaning is the following. Imagine that you want to do a, a, a prediction and you have a certain initial mistake, delta x zero, and you accept a certain tolerance, okay? And you wonder what is the maximum time such that I am sure that my prediction is smaller than the tolerance. You invert the formula, you have this, this result. You have that the predictability time is one over lambda logarithm of something. Okay, logarithm is a rather smooth uh, function. So what is really important here is one over, one over lambda. So is the, <clears throat> uh, okay, this is, uh, is the basic. Then there are a lot of uh, technical trouble. Don't, don't worry. It's just if you want to do a, a PhD in this stuff. Uh, uh, so, and, uh, um, so th then you, you can wonder, but why, for example, we know very well that uh, uh, the astronomer are very smart in the prediction. So about the eclipse, so the, the next uh, eclipse, uh, you, you can uh, look uh, in some books, say uh, you know that the next eclipse in South Africa, I don't know when it will be. And uh, in Italy, uh, I have no chance. It was uh, an eclipse when, when I was six, six, I remember very well. And uh, and then the next, I don't know when, I don't know, maybe my my grandchildren will see in, in, in Italy. And uh, so the prediction in, in astronomy is extremely simple. Hmm? Why in meteorology are not simple at all, because meteorology, usually the meteorology are not able to predict the weather in three weeks. Why? Maybe you can say the astronomer are much better. So, you know. Uh, so when they, you can ask uh, to, to put the, the astronomer in the meteorological service and uh, to solve the problem. But uh, this is wrong. Uh, this is wrong. Uh, uh, the, the, there is a technical reason why this is wrong. The reason is that uh, you have to look at this Lyapunov exponent. The inverse of Lyapunov exponent is the time. And if you look, also the, the solar system is chaotic. Uh, no, usually we say astronomical precision. It means nothing astronomical precision. Okay. Uh, astronomical precision on uh, uh, at the scale of our life, okay, uh, because the, the inverse uh, the inverse of the Lyapunov exponent the solar system is some million years. So million years is enormous. You want to predict uh, the next eclipse, the next century is nothing. Okay. On the contrary, on the contrary, in atmospheric circulation, this number is order one week, and this and that's it. This is the reason why the astronomers appear very smart. They are very lucky. For this. <clears throat> So about now, uh, in the recent time, there is a big enthusiasm for, for data, no? for data in data science. And still, now, still let me show this uh, statement about always uh, Poincaré. Uh, sorry, I forget the accent. Yeah? And the, the science is built up of fact as an house is with, with stone. But the collection of fact is no more a science than a heap of stone is an house. So this is, uh, I like a lot of this. Uh, so wh why I, I, I mentioned this stuff? So imagine that now uh, you say, okay, uh, you are a, a theoretical physicist, you like mathematics, and you want to do prediction using mathematics, using model. I detest mathematics, but I am very smart in computer science, and uh, I look around uh, the data, and maybe with the data I can try to predict avoiding mathematics. This is one uh, possible approach. Some people like, like a lot this. And uh, this can work, but uh, there is there some limitations. So, let, so let, let, let me uh, discuss this, uh, this possible approach. Uh, this possible approach uh, is the following. So this is the mathematical formalization of the sentence, sentence in, the, in the Bible. Uh, imagine that uh, you, um, the idea that from the same antecedent follow the same consequence. Imagine that uh, you know in general, this is not true. Imagine that you know that the system is described by certain, uh, uh, oh, sorry, vector. Vector means uh, a set of variables. Okay? Uh, um, we know the, the, this vector. And uh, uh, we know the, the story of this vector, the story of the, of the states of the system, L looking uh, uh, yesterday, two days ago, and so on. And you want to predict uh, the situation tomorrow. Okay, so you have this long series of numbers, and you want to predict 
Okay. So what is the idea? So since the system is deterministic, you look in the past, a situation which is close to the situation today. Okay, and then to say tomorrow, imagine that you find that this was uh, one week uh, la last uh, uh, Sunday, the situation is similar to today. No, last Sunday, no, two, two, Sunday ago, two, two, two Sunday ago. Uh, and so you see, okay, uh, the situation tomorrow will be like uh, to the last uh, two, two, two Monday uh, before. Huh? This is uh, obvious. No. And uh, so this. Uh, sound uh, a, 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 a way to, to solve the problem. Hmm? And then, of course, but you, you can wonder uh, if, if, this is, uh, the, the, if this is true or not. For example, Lawrence, the same Lawrence I discussed before, try to apply this method. Try to apply this method in a serious way, taking the meteorological map on North America, and they look uh, in the, his data, I don't know, something like uh, 40 years. And uh, he arrived to the conclusion that he was not able a situation similar to the situation today. And he concluded that the method doesn't work. Okay. And then you can wonder why the method does work. There is some, some, some deep reason or, or not. Uh, and so then, okay, since I am uh, a theoretician, the first, uh, Question is that, but it's true that it's possible to find the situation close to the present state. The answer is by Poincaré. Poincaré proved that uh, the, a result which uh, the student in mathematics and physics know very well, what is called uh, uh, recurrence theorem. A, in few words, apart technicality means that uh, if there is a, if you look at the st states of the system, uh, in the future, if you wait, uh, uh, there will be a certain time such that the, 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 the states will be close to the, to the initial states, okay? And uh, no, fine. So then, uh, okay, this, okay, this for people interested in history of science, it was a very important in the history of thermodynamics, but if you are not physicists, don't worry. And uh, uh, so this is an important result, but then uh, the, in the theorem, there is no indication how long you have to wait, okay? And, uh, um, the, the answer to the problem, how long you have to wait, has been solved by a Polish mathematician, Mark Katz. And the result is the following. Imagine that you start from, uh, from a certain region. And then, of course, the return time will depend from the point where, where you start. Imagine that you perform an average on this region, and you arrive to this result. The, the average return time is, uh, OK, certain constant, tau zero. And, uh, Inverse is proportional to the inverse of the probability to stay in this region. Fine. And then you say, okay, but now uh, how, how relate the, the, this probability to the physical problem? Uh, Moens uh, uh, introduced the idea of dimension. Okay. This is the, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the passing from uh, the PDF to, to, to PowerPoint was some. Some trouble, but um, uh, so the, uh, you have that this probability uh, is proportional to epsilon. So this is not a, is that okay? The epsilon is the size of the uh, of the um, of the region uh, A to this power. Okay, this power is not, uh, in our opinion, is a matter of the fact. So, for example, in in the in the um, uh, Lorentz system, this is something like two point something. Okay, uh, it's not that's not depend on how we are clever. It's, 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 it's an intrinsic property of, of the system. Now, uh, then, uh, if you look at the time, you see that the, 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 the time increases exponentially with this uh, with this d. So this means that uh, I am sorry, but for, for the uh, the conversion introduced some some. Uh, some trouble in the most important mathematical uh, aspect. So, uh, for example, this means that imagine that you want a, 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 a tolerance of 5%, and uh, you wonder if it's possible to use this method in a situation uh, with the dimension. If the dimension is large, where large means six or seven, it's practically impossible. So this is the reason that it's true that there exists uh, a situation close in the past, but it's not so easy to find. 
So this is the reason why, why, why Lawrence was not able. So uh, now le let me uh, mention a very, a very nice uh, uh, fact, which is a nice book from a historical point of view and a conceptual point of view, is about the title prediction. The title prediction uh, uh, in, in the, in, even now, but in the past it was extremely important because the, the, the trouble with the title prediction was the main uh, uh, origin of uh, disaster. And uh, um, it was a big interest uh, at practical level to predict the, the uh, to have the tidal prediction. And um, Lord Kelvin, the famous Lord Kelvin, and George Darwin, the, uh, the, the son of the famous uh, uh, Charles Darwin, um, in, uh, introduce, they are sort of say in modern term, a startup. Huh? Uh, they, they invent a method, a, a practical method to, 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 to perform, to predict, to predict the, the, the level of the, of the sea in, in, in each port. And uh, they would take money for this. Eh? It was not for free. It was not a free service. And uh, uh, they, they introduce, uh, uh, they introduce this stuff. So this is uh, something like uh, uh, 2000 kilos. So it's something besides. So you have this enormous uh, uh, GR or the of iron, I don't know what. Huh? And they, so for the, for the mathematician, this is a way to produce Fourier transform, uh, just a, 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 an ancestor of the fast Fourier transform, you know, an end Fourier transform. And uh, they, with this method, they, they were able to, to predict uh, the level of the, um, of the sea in the um, in the port. Why? So you say, but why Lord Kelvin? Okay, Lord Kelvin was a genius, of course. Huh? But even Lawrence was uh, maybe not a level Lord Kelvin, but uh, he was a, a genius. Even Lawrence. Why Lord Kelvin, uh, da, uh, George Darwin, was so smart? Huh? No, they, no, they simply they were very lucky. They, they were they were very lucky because uh, a posteriori now we know that the, the dimension of the problem of the type prediction is, is around three or four. And so it's not so difficult to do that. Of, unfortunately for Lorentz, the dimension is enormous. So even with five, even with seven is impossible, but in the case of atmosphere, dimension is some, some thousand. And so it's, it's hopeless. So the, the, it's, it's, li it's like the, the astronomer and meteorologist. Uh, the same problem if, if you, since are, some technical difference, you have this, uh, you have this trouble. Okay, well now let, let me just, ah, uh, I, have to, I have to say that my dear friend and colleague, Moes Jensen, said something, I disagree with the sentence of Moes. Moes say that the father of fractals is mandible. This is not true. The father is this gentleman, okay? This gentleman, this was. Actually, I agree with that, Okay, come on, it's not, it's, it's a marginal disagreement. And I, I have to say something. And uh, okay, apart this, he was a very important person, uh, not, not very well known, but uh, he gave astonishing contribution, not only to Fractal, but um, the, his, his, main, his, his main contribution is the, uh, introduce the idea of the weather prediction. So when you see, look at the TV, the method, uh, used to perform the prediction you see at TV is, is due to this gentleman. Uh, his idea was apparently obvious, but now, <laughs> uh, when you know the solution, the solution appears obvious. Uh, the, the idea, before him, the, the idea was to just look at the chart, the meteorological chart, and say, oh, is this, that means that the front go in this direction, because, uh, you know, my master told me that each time there is the, uh, the, the cloud after that mountain, then uh, this kind of method. And uh, the, the, was used, the, the Norwegian school, and uh, the Richardson had the intuition just to use the equation, like, like in astronomy. So, of course, the equation for fluid dynamics is very difficult, very complicated, but in principle, why not? So a partial differential equation for the mathematician. So the idea is, I take this equation are known, uh, the equation for the Navier-Stokes equation, the, um, uh, say, business equation, or whatever, uh, you take this equation, you integrate the equation, and uh, you solve the problem. And of, of course, you, you, you cannot do by, by end. You, you need a computer. And so the, the, first, the first attempt 
was used by Richardson himself uh, during the First World. During the First World, so since he was, he was a pacifist, he was a quaker, and um, uh, he didn't accept to, uh, to fight, but he participated in the war uh, as an ambulance driver. And um, so during the war, he, he, he worked something like 2,000 hours by end with some very, say, this uh, uh, rudimental uh, machine, like the, the rule. This, uh, and uh, he, he worked uh, some, some thousand hour, hours and uh, to, to perform a, a forecasting of six hours. And the result was completely wrong. And, uh, but uh, he concluded that, uh, yes, the, the result is wrong, but uh, not because the method is, is wrong. Uh, there are some technical difficulties. He realized that some technical difficulty. And, uh, in, 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 the, in the future, somebody will solve the, 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 the technical difficulty. This was his idea. And it was right. It was right. It was necessary to wait uh, some decades. And uh, the man who solved the trouble is this one, the von Neumann who said also something wrong, but uh, in this case, it was, was, was right. Uh, von Neumann, uh, after the war, uh, he was the, the leader of a very important uh, meteorological, well, they say now in transdisciplinary project. So he was one of the first to put together people from different uh, fields, like mathematics, meteorology, engineering, computer science, and so on. And he realized that in order to do good prediction, it's important some some ingredient so uh, two are rather tech practical so you need the uh, fast numerical algorithm okay but this in any field then you need the computer okay also this is okay what is important i put in bold from a conceptual point of view is to use effective equation what means this is very important what means the he realized that uh, he realized that uh, the um maybe i wrote before no, okay, I didn't know. Uh, let me say, the, he realized that uh, the uh, wrong uh, result of, of, of Richardson was because he used the correct equations. So, come on, if the correct equation, the result must be correct. No, uh, because uh, using the correct equation, you have uh, a lot of uh, phenomena like uh, fast uh, modes, uh, wave, and so on. And if you look at the computer, you have numerical instability. Now we know, but at that time, nobody and the idea of numerical instability. So poor Richardson treated the correct equation, but treating the correct equation with the wrong delta t, he arrived to a wrong conclusion. No, using the correct equation with the wrong delta t. So if you want to use a large delta t, you have to introduce the fatty equation. Okay, this is what is called uh, quasi just rough. Okay. So this, 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 story, this story of the correct equation is, uh, is present everywhere in science and technology. For example, uh, uh, just mentioned two important uh, problems already mentioned by, by moments. So the protein folding. The protein is a very complicated uh, system. And uh, uh, why is very complicated? Oh, okay, they are not an expert. We are, we are an expert in the audience. So uh, one, one of the reasons, at least one of the reasons, is that in the protein dynamics are involved many different characteristic time from uh, 10 to minus 10 seconds up to one second. So uh, why the climate is difficult? The climate is difficult because you have to consider very different phenomena, ranging, uh, for example, three-dimensional turbulence at the scale of a few centimeters, a few seconds, until uh, the deep uh, uh, ocean uh, current, uh, which has time or the 10, 10 to three or even 10 to four Years. So it is not possible to put all this system on a computer, even very big. So it's necessary to introduce, uh, uh, so to say, some effective equation. Like, so for example, for Neumann, Charlie has been able to introduce this description for the weather, for, for the for meteorology. Instead of to use the original equation of Richard, so they introduce what is called um, quasi geostrophic equation. So this is. So and the, 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 to use the, the effective equation, there is a great, uh, great advantage because you can not only with the, the effective equation you, um, you, 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 uh, you are able to, to use the computer in, in, in a more efficient way, but uh, uh, you also to, uh, to understand much better the, the, uh, the, the, the problem of the, the problem of the, the economy. Okay, let, let, let me try to to summarize my, my talk. 
Exactly. So in the prediction, there are ma ma many possible troubles. So one trouble is chaos, but chaos at the end is chaos very popular, but at the end is not a big problem. Because uh, so if, if you know the equation at the end, uh, chaos is under control. So it's not a big problem. So of course, it's the inverse of the upper exponent uh, is short. Uh, this is the end of the story, but this is not your responsibility. If you are, uh, if you insist to study meteorology, uh, so you you can you can uh, you can study solar system. Uh, so, but uh, uh, then the the um, serious problem, which appear very very often, is the fact that the interesting phenomena uh, involve very different variables. Not only very diff not only very many different variables. This is not. Uh, uh, the trouble with different characteristic time. This is the, 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 the real trouble, okay? And so, and uh, yeah, the lack of accurate model. So we, we are not able to, to, uh, to build the model. Uh, uh, so uh, one way to, to, to solve the, the, the trouble is, for example, is to use uh, so artificial data science approach uh, but that data science approach has this rather severe uh, limitation. I am not saying that is impossible. I have to say that uh, at the least uh, there is some some uh, um, some difficulty, and uh, at least from my point of view, maybe my point of view is not uh, completely. So I am professor of theoretical physics. So what do you want? So and uh, so <laughs> I have also some personal uh, um, wish. Uh, no, but the joke. So um, my point of view is that uh, I suspect that the, a good, maybe not unique, but up, up to now, uh, the, the good uh, proper approach to the understanding of a complex phenomenon, in particular the prediction, is to build an effective equation. And so this is a, a difficult problem. It's a very difficult problem for uh, people working in, 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 in um, uh, theoretical physics, in applied mathematics, uh, uh, almost everywhere there is this uh, this problem of the building of the, the FET equation. And uh, that's it. Thanks for your time. Uh, thank you, for Professor, Professor Volpiani, for that interesting talk. I think we need to get some PhD students now and train them how to predict the lotto numbers. So yeah. we, we need to have a whole... <laughs> let, let me know. I, I can participate. <laughs> yeah. in this. Yeah. Sure. Is there any questions for Professor Volpiani from the audience? Is that any from the... Professor Ma? So, <clears throat> yes. Thank you for the talk. Uh, thank you for the talk, especially when you said astronomer may be a bit luckier than any other scientist. I'm so happy. <laughs> and um, uh, basically, I, I think my, my comments is not really a question, but I, I basically think the many of the sociological uh, phenomena, like a uh, finance market, for instance, yeah. is kind of a, another level of chaos. It, it's not, not first order. But no, no. I, I, in my personal opinion, the stock market is not another level of uh, uh, chaos. Is another level of description. It's not obvious that there exists a, a law, there exists a, 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 a non. A, a, a. So some some people believe that the, the the behavior of the financial market is ruled by some uh, um, uh, uh, some rules may be probabilistic, which are which are independent from us. Okay, this is the point of view. I, I, my personal opinion is this is not true because uh, there are. It's very important. For example, imagine that you 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 try to do a prediction about the the price of coal. Okay, and then next week Putin decides to put on the market. Uh, some uh, an enormous uh, quantity of gold to destroy the Ukrainian Ukraine, uh, economy. Uh, you have immediately a collapse. Okay, and so uh, this in the past it was it was very 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 frequent. So the, uh, the some political decision uh, can change a lot uh, the, the prediction, and that's it. So the, the, the if, if the people if the human are involved in a phenomena, 
the idea that uh, these are ruled by a, a, a law, like the a law of the atmospheric uh, uh, fluid, uh, is not is not convincing. Yeah, so I, I'm interested in, in the sentence that says that uh, for dimensions that are greater than five or six, it is difficult to build models from the just yeah. data. Yeah. Okay? Uh, so, so does that mean, uh, uh, you know, what we are talking about machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence? is not able to do that either. No, my, my statement was not so sharp, but uh, I, 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 my sense was that if you apply the, the simplest approach in terms of analogs, this is not easy, it's not possible. Then uh, uh, you can try with a more sophisticated uh, approach, but in any case, you need uh, to find uh, so the, 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 the Bible tradition to, uh, to look, uh, so if you want that the machine learn something, the machine must be have the possibility to, to observe the situation at least twice. This is just the argument. Now, the problem is that what means to observe the situation? Uh, this is about the problem, what, what, what is the state of the system? So if you introduce a, a cost graining, for example, then you have a reduction of the dimension. So probably, I suspect that the reason why uh, so the machine uh, methods are able to uh, to use for the treatment of uh, images because in, they are able to classify the image in some oops, uh, in some cost grain variable. I suspect uh, I, I, even the experts are not able to, to, to give an answer, but the answer will be will be in, in that direction. So. Uh, to, to decrease the dimension, to decrease the effective dimension. But decreasing, decreasing the dimension can be very dangerous. Because maybe you decrease uh, too much. And uh, for example, there is a famous story of the, um, uh, to distinguish uh, uh, dogs and wolf. And uh, at, at the beginning, uh, the, 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 the machine uh, intelligence mental was not able to distinguish uh, uh, dogs and wolf. But then realize why. Because uh, in, in the photo, uh, in all the photo where there is some the snow, the, um, the machine say, oh, this is a wolf. Because uh, the, 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 the system uh, decide that the important factor was the presence of the snow. Okay, I guess here there is not this problem. But so in, the, in Scandinavia, even in Italy, there is this problem. Can I, can I just follow up? So does that mean that we actually need a theory? In order to, to get yeah, to at, the, at the least uh, at the least some uh, uh, something which uh, uh, is close to a theory, maybe not a theory, but some uh, uh, reasonable model and so on. Maybe theory is uh, too, too pompous, but uh, yeah, we need some. Uh... Angela, can I ask a question? Is the reason why we can predict the weather maybe tomorrow, or the next day, but not three weeks? Yeah, from exactly. Now? It, it, it because because of the value of the Lyapunov exponent, because the value of the Lyapunov exponent. Okay, it was the Lyapunov exponent. This was a rough definition then. But whatever, uh, the the inverse of the Lyapunov exponent is the order one week or ten days. So not for sure, nobody will be able to to predict the weather in uh, three months. This is out of. Uh, Maybe we'll, in the future, we'll be able to. No, because in the problem of the prediction, there are many, for example, the people using the uh, computer, they don't use a perfect model. Also, the, the fact that the model is not perfect, this gives you uh, trouble. But this trouble is not very big. It's the same trouble that you have with the Atlas point. So maybe you with a factor two. Good. Thank you. That just means for me to thank you for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Except for talking about Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this session for the Nobel Co Laureate Committee. Um, I just got two announcements to make. The first announcement is that there's refreshments and eats outside. And I'm going to ask you to please interact with our guests while, while we, we enjoy the refreshments. 
And the second is that tomorrow at 10 o'clock, uh, we have another session back here. And we've got two uh, uh, very exciting speakers again, Professor Luca Gambertoni from uh, Italy and Professor uh, Orel from, uh, Eric Orel from uh, Sweden. So uh, I hope you come back tomorrow at 10 o'clock for the next session and we look forward to a very nice session. So thank you very much for coming again and I hope you enjoyed the refreshments. <laughs>